can be easy to overthink, to try and calculate. And, you know, I want to make sure if I'm going to a, a composite CPD that it's it's the best one. Later on, I think it's different when you've already done a lot, you can afford to be a lot more selective. But early on, I think just go for that CPD that's accessible because the reality is any CPD at that point in your journey, you're going to be learning. CPD Junkie Dental Podcast is about connecting with passionate Australian dentists who are improving themselves and have attended various CPD courses. My aim is to find out for you the best CPD courses around and what they did to help get them to where they are today. So you can consider doing it and becoming the best dentist you can be quicker. Hi, CPD Junkie fam. I'm your host, Dr. Lawrence Doan, and today we are joined by Dr. Daniel Mariowski. Graduating from the La Trobe University of Victoria with a master's in dentistry, he went on to complete advanced training in cosmetic and reconstructive dentistry. Determined to foster a sense of community, he is a faculty member at the La Trobe University and co-founded General Dental Residency. In the process, he also founded Studio Smiles, his dental practice in Hyatt, Victoria. Dr. Dan, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Lawrence. This is a very kind introduction. <laughs> Makes me sound more, more important than I am, but uh, I'll take it. I'll take it. So, tell us about your CPD or dental journey so far. Yeah, well, I mean, currently I would be, what is it coming on? This would be my fifth year out from dental school. And uh, I think the journey with CPD, I think one thing I've, I've found over time is that it varies so much from year to year. You know, uh, coming out, I was hungry. <laughs> I was a, a CPD junkie, really. Um, yeah. It was courses every other weekend, flying all across Australia. I remember we were doing courses one week in Sydney, the next week in Brisbane, went out to New Zealand, like really hitting the CPD circuit hard and just trying to absorb as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think with time, the you know, probably the approach uh, or my approach in here with CPD has become a lot more targeted. Uh, I think that as life gets busier, you know, we all get older, we're getting into different stages of our, our lives, whether it be to do with relationships, you know, family, housing, etc. cetera. Um, you know, the time and dedication for CPD, it changes. And I think we have to be a lot more selective. Um, so these days I'm, very selective <laughs> with CPD and um, yeah, it's just a time thing you know it's uh, I think that if you really want to delve into something and really upskill you I'm a big believer in fully committing mm -hmm. and uh, yeah it just takes a lot out, out of me I don't know maybe I'm just getting old I think when you hit your late 20s uh, you know creeping slowly towards 30 it gets a little harder <laughs> yeah yeah so, I mean, okay, so talk about the early part. So, you're, you're flying through different things. How are you kind of deciding, you know, what, what courses were you attending? Like, how did you choose which one to go to? Because, you know, for a lot of graduates at the moment, sometimes, you know, there's so much out there. How do I pick it? You know, how did you go about doing it initially? Definitely. Uh, look, to begin with, I think that it can be easy to overthink to try and calculate and you know i want to make sure if i'm going to a, a composite cpd that it's it's the best one but the reality is you know over the course of your lifetime as a, as a practitioner you're probably going to go to a lot of these sort of cpds and and you're going to learn something different from each one so i think in some sense we can get caught up a little bit too much overthinking that process of deciding which cpd early on Early on. Later on, I think it's different when you've already done a lot, you can afford to be a lot more selective. But early on, I think just go for that CPD that's accessible, um, that your friends are going with, that you've heard about, seen about. Uh, because the reality is any CPD at that point in your journey, you're going to be learning. You're going to be learning. So for me, it was more you know, to do with the topics. I wanted a bit of a buffet. Mm -hmm. I wanted to try out everything. And I did in my first year. I went for CPD on topics. Uh, we, you know, I did a weekend course on rubber dam, a weekend course on anterior composites. There was another course that I did oral surgery in New Zealand, which was like three days. Um, I did a Botox and lip filler course. I did everything. I did <laughs> anything you could imagine that is accessible um, to a new graduate. I did, and you know what? Half of it I don't use. I, for example, you know, Botox and lip fillers is is not something that I took up in my practice, but. I don't regret any of it. Uh, mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I think, yeah, just trying to expose yourself to as much as possible starting out is great. And then, you know, later down the track, that's where you start to narrow down and sort of say, you know what, this year I'm going to focus on X or Y. 
Uh, but to begin with, you just, you got to try everything because you never know what's going to stick. I mean, you just don't know what's out there really. I mean, who knew even as a dental student that, that we could do Botox and lip filler. I mean, I certainly didn't. I think these days with the, the reach of social media and a lot of people putting so much more of themselves out there, it's that knowledge is a lot more available, you know, in terms of as a student, I think students are a lot more switched on as to what is possible as a dental practitioner. Yeah. Um, but heck, I didn't know that when I was a student. Yeah, not fair enough. So yeah, like as you're alluding to, so I've, after a few years of doing, you know, flying in, fly out, doing all these different courses interstate as well. Yeah. And then you started to realize, okay, I, I need to kind of narrow it down. How did you decide to narrow it down into, okay, this is what I'm going to do instead as opposed to all these other ones? I mean, how do we choose anything in life? I think uh, at, at some point, uh, you just have to make a decision and stick with it, you know, because at the end of the day, uh, you don't know. You really don't know until you're, you're a few years down the track of pursuing, whether it be Botox and lip filler or Invisalign, you really don't know what it looks like integrated into your daily practice. So for me, I mean, there were a few sort of key decisions. Um, I think number one, I decided that for whatever reason, I wanted to be proficient at wisdom teeth removal. You know, it wasn't particularly well thought out decision. It was just, it seems fun. It seems challenging, which I think is important. And uh, it seems like a worthwhile pursuit in the sense that it's a, a great service to be able to offer patients. Um, and it's something that I think a lot of us see in day-to-day -day practice. So for me, you know, early on, it was wisdom teeth was a big one. The other one was Invisalign and, uh, or, or rather just clear aligners. And, and that decision-making was a bit easier. It's to do with, you know, what are patients actually want? Uh, because as a dental practitioner, I think a lot of the time, a lot of the things that we're talking to patients about that we're offering, it's not necessarily things that they they want or that they perceive a need for. Um, and probably clear aligners, you know, straightening your teeth is one of the few things where people do perceive that need. Um, and they do come asking for those treatments. So for me, that was another easy one to sort of say, you know what? Makes sense. And it also goes hand in hand with, with wisdom teeth removal, funnily enough. And I think that when you can have skills that um, overlap, it does uh, does make it a lot easier. And, and, you know, routinely now I'll be taking out, especially upper eights, um, for, for example, class two cases to get that little bit of space that we need. Because I think uh, as a lot of people that do orthodontics will, will, will say that the majority of cases that we see doing adult orthodontics is all class two patients. You know, that's, that's the most common. And um, yeah, I've been having a lot of success removing those upper eights and doing a bit of distalization. Um, so yeah, I think that if you can tie in those skills and start to weave a little bit of a Think of it like your own internal, um, super internal referral network. Uh, I think that it's, uh, yeah, it just means you can use the skills that that you've trained for, which is, uh, you know, as a practitioner, that's all you could really ever want. Yeah, I mean, look, I would agree with you on that point. Like a lot of the courses I would pick would be des would be determined by maybe the clientele that I'd be seeing um, in in the practices. Um, otherwise, it may not be as useful. But, you know, how did you decide and pick, you know, this particular wisdom tooth course, you know, in, you know, in another country is the one I want to go attend as opposed to maybe some of the other ones that might be available? Again, like any decision in life, you know, how, how do patients pick a dental practice? They, they ask around, they look up and read Google reviews and same, same. So, you know, I think these days that information is so accessible. Uh, when it comes to courses via Facebook and Instagram, um, where people are posting courses, you can see the comment threads, you know, I often would, would uh, directly message, uh, you know, you'll see someone posting that for a course and then a few people might comment saying, oh yeah, I, I went here, I liked it, blah, blah, blah. And often I would direct message those people and, and sort of find out a little bit more about what was good, what was bad. Um, but at the end of the day, I think it, it's hard to have a bad CPD course. You know, I think the most people that are that are in this game, at least in Australia, they are very dedicated to what they do. And sure, there'll be some that are a bit better than others. But um, I think a lot of it's just to do with mindset is to me, especially nowadays, if I go into a CPD course and I learn one or two things, I consider that a win. You know, I'm not looking for a CPD course that's going to totally change my perception and paradigm on dentistry. I mean, those courses are out there as well. But 
to me, it's like the, these little one or two, one or two things that that really actually make a humongous difference. Um, and so, yeah, I think that we we have to have realistic expectations with CPD as well. Um, I think in some sense, uh, over time, maybe some of us have, have got the wrong idea around CPD, like it's this panacea where we go and all of a sudden we're going to come back and be expert masters at, at these procedures. And, and this one, even if it's a $5,000 course, whatever it is, is suddenly going to you know, transform our practice. But but the reality is that's, that's just not how CPD works. Um, you know, CPD, I find uh, when we talk about traditional CPD, so, you know, that weekend course, that three-day course, you know, which is the typical CPD that we, we tend to see, um, you know, I really see that as a spark, you know, that is just a spark to ignite that journey of learning and practice in that particular field or skill. You know, it is not in and of itself a, um, how much can you really learn? you know, in those couple of days. So, um, yeah, to me, it's all about the application, the application. So picking the CPD, you want to, yeah, you want to choose CPD that you're, you're able to, and you're, you're willing to immediately commit to implementing. Cause that's why I never did, you know, Botox and lip fillers or a few other things, because, uh, if you don't immediately implement it, or if there's high barriers to implementing, for example, with Botox and lip filler, um, you know, you have to be aware that if you want to implement that in your practice, you need an arsenal of gear. You know, that's another reason why, for example, I, even though I've done a course on fixed orthodontics, I've, I've never placed braces or any kind of fixed appliance um, outside of a bonded retainer because you need a lot of crap, part of my language, to, to do these procedures. And so, you know, I think sometimes when, when you have CPD that has a higher barrier to entry, where they want you to have specific equipment and all this sort of stuff, it uh, it becomes really hard to implement. So I think that's another big factor for me is I want to attend CPD that, that is, uh, how should I say that, that simplifies procedures that sort of systems agnostic. It doesn't, you know, not the CPD that says use this, you need to use this exact forcep or you need to use, you know, these are the brackets that we use and blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm not interested in that. Um, I want to know the fundamentals and then I want to go through my own journey of, of, you know, picking out these equipments and, and figuring it out because it's just easier for me in my own hands, I think learning in that fashion. Mm. That's interesting because obviously a lot of graduates, right? They contemplate when they graduate, they're like, I want to do, you know, implants. I want to do ortho and do it all at the same time. Like, you know, they just want to go guns blazing. So what do you have any thoughts on that or an opinion on that given what you've said? I mean, I think it's great to get exposed to it all, you know, do a two day course on all of these things. Why not? But, but just be realistic. You're not going to be implementing it all. I mean, that's where it starts. And once you've had your little, it's like a buffet, you know, you go around if, if, if you're, ta- I went to a buffet recently for my, my dad's 60th birthday. We oh, went nice. to uh, Melba at the Langham um, in, in Melbourne here. And we, we went to the buffet and what do you do at the buffet? Okay. Um, there's always the funny thing where the waiter brings you in. They show you to your table, you, you sit down and then they go, oh, I'll leave you to it. And then you stand up immediately and you run off to, <laughs> to the buffet table. Um, and, uh, you know, you do a little circle, you check out what's what's on offer. For, you don't start. I mean, I think you, the correct way, you don't start piling your plate straight away. You check it all <laughs> out. You do you know, one or two laps and then you start. You have your cold course, you know, your, your, your hot course. And then, you know, you, you take a bit of everything. But what happens is there's a few things that you really like. And so the things you really like, you go back for a third course and, and that third course is the best one, you know, because that's the one where you pile on all the stuff that, the, that was actually good at the buffet. And, uh, you know, that's the most enjoyable part. And I think CPD is the same. I think it's the same. I think that once you've had a little sample um, sampling of everything, you got to go back, pick your favorites and double down on that. And uh, you know what? probably across the lifetime of your career, if you're really committed, you will get into all these things. You will do a bit of this, you'll do a bit of that. And then you'll dive deep for a few years on implants and dive deep for a few years on orthodontics. And um, you're sort of building, it's almost like a cake. You're building each layer, but um, that foundational year, it's like university. You got to, you got to learn everything high level first before you can, can get deep. And, you know, uh, unfortunately at university, they don't really teach high level or, well, for us anyway, they didn't really teach too much high level orthodontics or, or implants. I know those were the, I think the two things you mentioned, you know, they, they taught the diagnostics a little bit, but they didn't actually tell us like 
how do you move teeth or what does it mean to put an implant in um so yeah getting that high level knowledge that maybe universities still kind of skip down on or same for botox or injectables etc that it's, it's always going to be beneficial you know because these days i refer a ton of patients out for botox treatment um routinely routinely and i wouldn't do that if i didn't know what was possible if i didn't know how it worked uh so yeah i think all cpd is worthwhile at the end if you want to be a well-rounded clinician i think the most the most dangerous thing to do is is to be that clinician that just does general dentistry and and just did a course on orthodontics and that's the only thing that you know i think that's the most dangerous place to be in because you don't know what you don't know you you, you know you're not going to be able to to make those appropriate calls and referrals when when things do come up that that might actually benefit your patients yeah so i mean look i know you're a massive believer in recent graduate cpd journeys right and then you went to go on and co-found gdr so how has that shaped you know how that come about and you know why did it come about so look, GDR, uh, General Dental Residency, was born out of it was it was born out of this this strong feeling that I had and that Alex, my co-founder, had that that new graduates didn't have this this buffet, you know, that it that it wasn't readily available the sampling menu of you know dentistry, whether it be restorative, um, preventive, orthodontic, etc. and and you know, you could piece together your own buffet, but, but no one had actually put together that buffet table. Mm. And, uh, you know, for us, that was the first thought was, you know what, there should be a CPD program available to new graduates that does it all for you. You don't need to think about, do I go to this course or that course? How do I piece it together? You just do this one course that's relatively affordable. Um, and that has a built in mentorship component because, at the time and i think still now there's there's this big sort of sort of talk and emphasis on on mentorship and uh yeah it just made a lot of sense and 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 a big part for us too at the time or for me anyway was the the community aspect you know i felt very strongly that there was a big lack of community when it came to new graduates and and it was just born out of this this thing where we all graduate and then we all end up working across the country in different places. You know, you, you had your tight knit group of university friends, but everyone disperses in the people working in regional areas and city areas and you trade stories, you know, when you meet up, but, but those friendship groups, you know, some of them start to drift apart and, and uh, it can feel hard, especially if you're working in a, in a small practice to feel connected to the, the dental community. If, if you don't, don't have that regular contact and and CPD is is one of the best ways to be connected to the dental community. I mean that there isn't a course that I don't go to nowadays where I don't bump into a ton of people and it's always the best part of every course. So that's really what what kind of sparked the yeah the journey of trying to create that um, that CPD program and I think Alex has carried it on beautifully. I mean I I had to step back because. Uh, you know, I was starting to be interested in other other business endeavors, and and uh, you know, I just I, I was finding it hard to 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 find the time that it needed because it was like a little baby at the time. Um, do you have kids, Lawrence? No, I don't have kids. <laughs> it was like a little baby at the time. It needed a lot of a lot of food, and it still does. But it's it's you know, it's it's walking now, and I, I think Alex has done a phenomenal job of of carrying it forward. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned to it, you know, there's, as a clinician, you reach a certain point where you start to contemplate practice ownership, being a specialist, being a super dental GP, you know, or, you know, starting a family. So what are your thoughts and how did, what inspired you to open up your own dental practice? Yeah, it's funny. I find a lot of your questions, Lawrence, around, um, you know, how did you decide this? Or, you know, how does one decide this? And I, I don't know, I, I'm a big believer. I can't remember where I read this. Or, or came across it. I think it was in a, in a book or something. But, it, you know, these days where we are dumbfounded with the sheer volume of of decisions that we have to make in, a, in any given day, what I'm going to have for breakfast, you know, everything. When you go to the supermarket aisle, do I get this pasta sauce or one of the other 1,600 pasta sauces in front of me? And, you know, at the end of the day, I think a, a lot of the time the the decision doesn't matter as much as the action. Um, at the end of the day, I'm a big believer that you just have to decide 
and then you just have to run with it um, and keep running with it until it, it's maybe not working anymore. And, and that's where you start to think about pivoting and doing something different. And um, so for me, going into practice ownership was not a was not a well thought out decision <laughs> it, it was it was really just this idea that you know what there's two pathways going forward i felt one is specialization and the other for me at the time was practice ownership because i'd always been interested in the idea of running a business yeah, i come from a background where my dad was a, a a vet practitioner and he always had his own business and and so he was a very big proponent of working for yourself mm. and that external influence you know definitely pushed me heavily in that direction yeah um so you know at that point the decision was made easy because i unfortunately did the once i started down the the journey of looking into specialization i quickly realized that it wasn't for me for a number of very specific reasons. You know, the only specialty I was interested in at the time was oral surgery, either oral surgery or oral maxillofacial surgery, which I think a lot of people in Australia don't realize. Those are actually two very separate specializations. Um, mm. There's not a lot of countries like ours where they are separate, um, yeah. but you know, I was strongly considering those. And so I was gunning, you know, coming out of uni, I was gunning for some of the jobs that, that are almost required to go down those pathways. And, and, you know, I didn't get in, I was, I was gunning for this job. I remember at Monash, uh, hospital, mm -hmm. they have like a, there's only, there's only maybe two or three jobs in Melbourne, like in the whole state that really set you up for a, a pathway down towards, um, specializing in, in one of those surgical fields. And the reality of those worlds is if you don't get them, it becomes really hard to, to, to sort of break your way in. Mm -hmm. And you can later on in life and things like that. And, and it's always possible, but very quickly I realized that. So I got into like the final interviews. I think there were like three of us left and then I didn't get the position. And, you know, the part of that process that I hated the most was that my fate, it felt like it wasn't in my control. Mm. You know, here I was, you know, really passionate, really gunning towards this pathway only to be knocked back by, you know, just some arbitrary decision-making process. You know, maybe I said something wrong in the interview, whatever it might be. And, you know, to me, that was a very quick realization that this, the whole journey of going down, particularly the, the surgical pathway, um, is fraught with things being out of your control. Mm. I don't know how much you know about, especially the oral maxillofacial pathway, but there are so many checkpoints along that very long journey yeah. that you can get knocked back and then you're pretty much stuffed yes. and it happens all the time. And so to me, that just didn't sit right, you know, especially in today's day and age. I think that there's a big movement towards, I guess, in general, with our generation feeling, uh, you know, a lot more independent. We want to take control of our own actions, our, our own destiny, for lack of mm -hmm. a better word. And the, the, these traditional specialization pathways often do not account for that. You know, you just, you sort of, I felt like I was there sort of, you know, on my knees begging and then <laughs> that I just had to, you know, take it or not. And, and yeah. to me, that just wasn't, it, it wasn't, it wasn't something I was going to be willing to go through for yeah. a long period of time. And, and business was the exact opposite of that, right? It was, it was take total control, right? Like you are responsible for everything. Mm -hmm. You're responsible for your staff, the patients, the business, like everything comes down to you and your decision making. Mm -hmm. And you have total, you have to take total ownership of that responsibility that if something goes well, it's because of you. If something goes wrong, it's also at the end of the day because of you. It's not because of your staff, it's because you didn't pick the right staff or you didn't train the right staff. Like you have to take that responsibility. And and to me, that was almost like the opposite. And, and that just, uh, to me, that, that was much more appealing. Yeah. It was much more appealing of, of being able to, to have that control. Mm -hmm. um, and so then Economy. it became apparent. Yeah. And the, the only decision at that point was, you know, do I open a business now or later? And I thought, heck, why not? Why wait? So that's what I did. I wouldn't recommend it to most people, but uh, <laughs> that's, that's a different discussion. Yeah. Well, I mean, okay. Well, I mean, what are some of the biggest challenges that you had faced when opening up your practice and how did you, you know, overcome them? You know, opening a practice isn't difficult. 
So I, I would actually say opening practice is quite easy, right? That's the easy part. That's the fun part. <laughs> you have to pick, oh, what, um, you know, wow, what composite am I going to use? Or, uh, you know, oh, I can get the fancy rubber dam now because, <laughs> you know, I'm in charge and all that. And that's fun. You know, that's fun. That's easy. That's easy. I mean, look, there's a lot of decisions to make signage and staffing and blah, blah, blah. But but that's not hard. I'm operating a business as hard. Anyone can start a business. Anyone can start a business, you know, as long as you've got a bit of reference and, and the ADA have quite good resources. And if you've got a few friends, I mean, before I opened a business, uh, a dental practice, I, I spoke to like some 15 to 20 practice owners about, you know, what their challenges were, et cetera. And um, yeah, so I mean, it. Uh, I wouldn't say it was a challenge. It was actually easy. It was fun. Okay. It's operating the thing. That's that's the challenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can we can we build? I mean, like, yeah. So, how do you overcome some of these challenges that you would have faced in that process? Or, you know, how would you go about building your team of staff and associates? And you know, what qualities do you look for when you're hiring new employees? Lawrence, I'd be lying if I have the answers to these questions. Um, <laughs> it's it's such a huge journey of learning. I mean, the 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 journey of learning about business or, or business in dentistry. It's uh, Think of it like a, a, a journey of learning like implants and orthodontics together at the same time and trying to become a, you know, a master clinician of both. It's, it's, um, it's phenomenally challenging, I think. And, and for me, and, and this is something for everyone to bear in mind. I think if you start a, a dental practice is for, for a long time, your CPD journey will take a back seat because your, your dental CPD journey, because, because you're on a new journey now. And, and that journey has very little to do with teeth and everything to do with business. It's understanding what does bookkeeping mean? You know, what do accountants do? What happens when you have employees that are, well, I don't want to get into to any specifics, but you know, you have HR issues. Mm -hmm. You have HR issues, people that don't show up to work or people that do things that they shouldn't do. And um, whether that be legal, illegal, you know, and how do you manage all these things? It is a totally different world. And, and that really starts to take over. And so, uh, I mean, the only thing I've learned throughout that process is, is uh, you, you need to be willing to reach out more and to have more help and not try and figure everything out yourself because uh, the dental community, the community of dental practice owners is so kind and so giving and, and, so generous and these days if i have a problem i straight away message four people at the same time saying hey you know this is happening what would you do and it's no different with my dentistry these days as well like i i am dealing yesterday oh not yesterday last week with my first implant failure mm -hmm. and straight away i'm shooting across like all the photos uh, yeah three or four different people at the same time everyone's saying something different <laughs> <laughs> which is which is the beauty of it all right um mm -hmm. but uh yes yeah, so i think overcoming those challenges is just being being willing to uh just reach out more and not, and not feeling that that it's that it makes you any worse off you know i think sometimes there's a feeling that we don't want to um we don't want to share our burdens we don't want to share our failures and we don't want to you know be vulnerable in that sense and uh, at the end of the day, I think we're all the better for it when we can reach out to that community, when we can um, kind of put our pride, so to speak, on, a, on, a, on, on the back seat and, and uh, yeah, just talk more, just talk more because it's, it's a, there's a lot of stuff that we all go through it clinically, business-wise, and everyone's going through the same stuff at the end of the day. And, and while it's not necessarily um you know the healing band-aid to to just know that other people are going through it like other people they have advice and um you know sometimes when we can uh when we can just take that advice and skip out our own suffering you know process um it uh we can really come out on top um so if there's any general advice i would have about overcoming the challenges of, of opening a practice i would say is um you just need to need to be willing to ask more. And sometimes you, you got to be wary that I think there's this idea, there's this historic idea that you need to find a, a mentor, right? And then historically that was like this one person that was really dedicated to your learning and growth. 
you're probably because you work with them over a period of many years and and they really wanted the best for you and then that would be that you know one maybe two people that you really relied on heavily um but I, i'd say that these days i think that you know that concept of mentorship and and reaching out, i think that it, it's changed you know with with the way modern life is with how fast paced everything is how how busy busy everyone is and i think that the modern mentorship sh should and, and is really a lot more communal you know mm -hmm. and that's why i don't rely on one person when i have questions when i need help is i'm i'm reaching out to three four five people and and that's what i'd really encourage everyone to do as well is um you because it can be a lot to burden one person if you've got this one mentor whether that's your boss and you know a lot of um uh, i think this is a common uh, conversational topic is how do i find mentorship in my job and you know how do i find this workplace that's going to be supportive and i think a lot of people are waiting for that one person that's going to go bat for them and and yeah, you might find that, but but I think it's much easier and and perhaps even more beneficial to find that community, to find that group of people that you're all on that same journey and you can just constantly bounce, you know, ideas off each other and, and everyone's going to disagree and tell you something different and, and you know, your job's going to be to kind of navigate through that, but um, through the noise, so to speak, but but um yeah, I think that it's a lot more, a much more realistic vision of, of mentorship in the year 2023 is mm -hmm. um, that, that communal aspect. Yeah. If you like this episode, drop a comment below on your favorite part or leave a review. Don't forget to share it with your friends and we'll see you in the next episode of CP Junkie Podcast.